Hey, all you planeteers at home. Remember, turn off the faucet between usages and recycle those plastics. Or else, I'll turn you into a fucking tree. The Wood Elves of Athelorn have stood on the front line against the Beastmen and Militia Spirits of the Forest for millennia, a kingdom ever on the threshold of chaos, teetering on a knife's edge between light and dark. And in the winter of 2016, they became our very first glimpse of the might of the Elven Realms, combining the strength and ancient wisdom of the Wildwood with the speed and flexibility of a vengeful warhost. And upon the release of the Realm of the Wood Elves DLC, they quickly became my favorite faction in play on the battlefields of Total War. They're unlike any other, a lightning quick race that excels at threat elimination, drawing enemies out of position with superior mobility, then with laser precision and focus, isolating and destroying an army chunk by bloody chunk. But like many of their old world counterparts, the Azrai are suffering from Game 1 Syndrome, a horrifying disease that can only be cured by the agonizingly slow patch rates and content updates we've come to expect over the last 9 months. You know it well, the general malaise that signifies Game 1 races falling well behind their Game 2 counterparts. Just like the Empire and the Beastmen, we've already covered, and the Greenskins, who we have not, the things that make the Wood Elves unique on the campaign map are really beginning to show their age. They have a tiny selection of legendary lords and star positions to choose from, and there are quite a few issues with their implementation that need serious addressing at this point. Amber is probably the biggest, the bane of the knife ears existence. We've got a lot to talk about on that front, but unfortunately, it's not the beginning and the end of the Wood Elves problems. Now, thankfully, from a unit roster perspective, Creative Assembly hit it out of the park. There are a few nitpicks here or there that we could get into, but by and large, the Wood Elves had by far one of the best day one rosters of any race in the trilogy, in terms of comparison to their most recent army book. Yeah, we missed out on spell weavers and shadow dancers, and a great stag mount alongside some weapon variants and the exclusion of true flight arrows, but those losses weren't felt that acutely. Certainly not compared to the glaring omissions from the Beastmen, who would have benefited tremendously from having more magic choices or punching power in their lord slot, and missed out on some of their most impressive centerpiece monsters as well. The one regret I have about the unit roster itself, and I have to do this, I just need to reiterate my annoyance with the fact that the Empire has every lore of magic but lore of death, while the elder races that taught them magic in the first place, and were millennia old by the time their civilization was even a kernel in the mind's eye of Sigmar Heldenhammer, still have less magic options to choose from. There is still no reason the Lizardmen, Dark Elves, High Elves, and Wood Elves should have less magic to choose from than the humans who were still crawling in the dirt while they were busy forging world-spanning empires. The Azrai should absolutely have High, Dark, Death, Light, really any of the basic wins except Fire, which they actually did have access to on the tabletop, but just looking strictly at design, you might see why they'd be a little bit hesitant to burn their own forest down, but because it basically just doesn't synergize with the rest of the units they field. But it's crazy to me that they actually have less magic than the Empire of Man. Now you bring in some spell weavers, some lord level casters for the Wood Elves, and that would help tremendously. Wood Elves are extremely proficient at channeling the winds of magic, as any race that's been partying on the surface of the planet for almost 10,000 years would be, and that should be reflected in game, although adding their missing lords in the hero slot would completely be fine, and probably quite a bit easier actually than creating a whole new unit from scratch. Athelorn is home to some of the coolest units in the trilogy we've seen so far. Wild Riders are an absolute joy to use, Way Watchers are brutal from long range, and you have a fantastic mix of glass cannons, heavy hitters, and highly mobile infantry that is surprisingly good in a melee rushdown type situation. They're a great race on the battlefield, they're competitive in multiplayer, they are fun to use, they have a wide variety of tactics available that they can employ, and they're kind of unique in terms of the duality of their roster. It's kind of split straight down the middle between forest spirits that often harbor this vicious resentment towards them with a tanky and defensive tactical nature, while the elves themselves are super agile and very aggressive. Unfortunately, that duality doesn't really carry over very well to the campaign map itself, and a big reason for that is Amber. Amber just kind of sucks right now, but why? Why does it suck? Why is it pretty much going to be the main focus of this video and the focal point about what needs to change for the Wood Elves? Well, it's a mechanic that kind of makes sense if you delve into the lore, but only if you give it a cursory glance. And as we said, for every benevolent tree spirit who loves and harbors the Azrai, there's another who dreams of ripping them inside out by their buttholes. Shouldn't really come as a surprise, but the union between these two factions isn't exactly harmonious. 
even their legendary Lord Durthu, once a happy tree friend who would only ever consider murdering chaotic freaks, has grown hollowed and spiteful from loss. Where once he loved the elves, their mistakes have cost him and his forest very dearly quite a few times over the millennia. Many of Athelorn's spirits are malignant, cancerous tumors growing at the heart of the Wildwood, twisted by chaos and Morgor's essence, or long ago altered in the first wars against the demons. So from that standpoint, introducing a mechanic that shows they aren't exactly on the best of terms, that limits your ability to recruit elves if you're Durthu, or spirits if you're Orion, kind of makes sense. But here's the thing, the Wood Elves are basically the only faction in the game that is truly discouraged from utilizing their entire unit roster. Amber is required for your victory objectives, it's required for leveling up the Oak of Ages, and it's required for winning the campaign. It's a resource that is incredibly scarce if you actually play them the way they are meant to be played, an isolationist, secluded race that strikes out once a year on the wild hunt, then melts back into the shadows. A race that is meant to build tall and create this glorious woodland realm within their own home provinces, not wide while they cover the earth in this green tide. We saw that in an earlier patch for Total War Warhammer 2. It was not a good look for the Wood Elves at all. We also saw it in game one. It really didn't reflect how they were supposed to be played. It's simply not fun to play Wood Elves and have so many highlights of their roster locked away by the Amber mechanic. Imagine if we were to play Lizardmen and Stegodons and Carnosaurs were severely limited by some kind of dinosaur egg feature. Or if we were to play Chaos and Giants and Dragons and Shagas couldn't flock to your side. These kind of units are already limited anyway, locked behind late game tech and high level buildings, and it takes time, effort, and significant investment to get to the point where you can actually recruit them. Once I get to that point, I don't want yet another obstacle in my way. And that's what Amor represents. So what happens is, you're encouraged by the game to go out and conquer huge swaths of territory and create outposts the world over, painting the map green. But then you hit a situation where you aren't really able to defend these settlements. You stretch yourself very thin, and these outposts that were always meant to be expendable end up being super important for your empire, because you'll be hit with huge debuffs should they fall out of your hands and your amber go into the negative. It's inherently contradictory in design, it's contradictory to the established lore and preferred tactics of the Wood Elves, and it's just not fitting in any way, shape, or form. And to their credit, this is something Creative Assembly have actually come out and said themselves. They have admitted, in fact, C.A. Mitch, Mitch, I believe, was the one who initially came out and said it. He said, we're not happy with how the Amber system works right now. We're not happy with how it's implemented, and we would like to go back and change it at some point. They don't know if they will, but that's the idea. And since we know that they're going to be going back to all the old world races at some point, it's a fair bet that they are going to at least touch up the Amber mechanic at some point. So how would they go about doing that? Well, Amber should be a one-time collection. Once you've reaped it, it's yours forever. That way you don't have to invest heavily in defending these indefensible outposts. You go out, get what's yours on the wild hunt, and then you retreat back to the safety of Athel Lauren. Of course, this also means you won't be able to abuse a single settlement over and over, taking new amber every time it's seeded, but that's a good thing, because you should be encouraged to hit different parts of the planet every time the wild hunt comes around. Even if you're an isolationist race, there still needs to be a reason for you to interact with the outside world, and there are a couple of ways of doing this. One of the easier ones would be adding a new objective system alongside the Wild Hunt. Alongside the rebirth of Orion every spring in the Oak of Ages, this is the mechanic that makes the Wood Elves who they are and should have been well fleshed out from day one. And I'm going to be honest here, its current implementation is super boring and pretty far from what I had in mind when the DLC was first announced. Some bonuses to movement range and combat stats are great or whatever, but it's really pretty vanilla and not very interesting to see that in action. But what would be pretty cool is to give players specific settlements to attack and a lore explanation for why the Wild Hunt should be hitting that settlement next. Add some great rewards in terms of gold and amber at the end of the rainbow there, and you've got a nice fluffy carrot to keep me chasing and a reason to fight many different races. Think of the Crusades in Medieval 2, but instead of happening like every 30 or 40 or 50 turns, it's happening more like every 10, and you're always going to a new location with each wild hunt that spring. That's more along the lines of what I was thinking of when I first began brainstorming how the wild hunt should work in Total War Warhammer. Although less mutually assured religious genocide and more hilariously one-sided amber-induced xenocide, but you get the picture there. I think there's a lot of opportunity there to make it work like a Crusades mechanic where it makes you go fight a different faction 
and a different settlement every single time the wild hunt comes around. Now I'm going to be completely honest with myself here and realize that this is never going to happen. But one thing that I would absolutely love to see in the future is an in-depth world roots mechanic. Quick refresher, the world roots are the tendrils that spread forth from the Yoke of Ages and create these ley lines of power that run throughout the planet, coalescing in areas of magical forest that spirits like Durthu can use to quickly traverse the world. I'd want heroes to be able to bring these world roots back online, similar to how vampire fleet captains establish pirate coves, if maybe a little heavier on the investment and time commitment to actually get them running. Reconnecting these world roots to the weave would allow you to teleport armies to certain areas of the map. The Gaian Vale in Ulthuan, Lorelorn Forest in the Northern Empire, the Heart of the Jungle in the Southlands, and of course, Athol Lorne itself. And this could go hand in hand with these magical forests, giving players access to more powerful outposts, or even level 5 settlements like the ones that you can find in Athol Lorne itself, in the few areas that they actually appear. If the Wood Elves decided to conquer Avalorn and the Gaian Vale, for instance, rest assured, they would create a very impressive civilization there, not just a dinky little outpost. Now obviously, because of how strong teleportation would actually be, there would have to be some kind of limit and checks and balances in there kind of in place to prevent spamming, and of course in head-to-head -head, it could also be an issue as well. It would require heavy investment from the player to balance it appropriately, but I think that it could be balanced, and it's one of those things that would add an incredibly unique and flavorful way of traversing the map to a unique faction that honestly deserves it. This is a very lore-friendly way for CA to tackle that issue. I don't know if they ever would, they probably won't, but it would be a lot of fun to be able to create a stack with Durthu in Argolon and then suddenly appear in the Gaian Vale half the world away. It would be a very interesting way to invade an enemy country. Now in terms of legendary lords, it should be incredibly obvious at this point how behind the Wood Elves are from the rest of the pack. The Vampire Counts have like 37 named characters and generic lords that are even cooler than most legendary lords in the game at the moment, and even the Beastmen and the Empire have three legendary lords at the moment. The Wood Elves are proudly rocking two. Just two. Two named characters. You could even say they have a Durthu of named characters to choose from. Get it? Durth? Durthu? Hee <laughs> hee! But yeah, it's an issue. It's a big issue. Orion and Durthu are both really cool legendary lords. They're two of my favorite ones to play in campaign. They're tons of fun. They do need some loving though. I will say, Orion's speed should definitely be jacked up so that he can actually be used in tandem with his Wild Rider bodyguards because it kind of defeats the purpose of a bodyguard if they're like twice as fast as he is. Currently, they just super outpace him and it doesn't make sense because on the tabletop, he was actually the exact same move speed as Wild Riders. I believe they both had movement speed 10. So the living avatar of Karnas should not be slower than Mammoths or Throg or Gorbals or Sartorial. None of them, not a single one of them should he be slower. So yes, I don't advocate that he actually be like 90 move speed or 85 like Wild Riders are because I think that that would be a balance issue, but there's no reason that he can't be as fast as traditional heavy cap. Give him more speed, Give him Vanguard, and a ton of additional strategies would suddenly be opened up for the Wood Elves. Um, you'd be able to do a lot more Vanguard shenanigans in multiplayer and in campaign. It fits his lore and his aesthetic and his playstyle perfectly. I see no reason why you could not give him both of those things. And it would be very fitting from both a lore and a Total War perspective. Durthu is a little bit trickier, honestly. He's a fantastic world beater lord in campaign. But in multiplayer, he's just kind of okay. He's completely workable in plenty of matchups, but he has the same issues that so many other big, slow, single entity monsters have. He's easy to shoot, he's easy to snipe out with artillery, he is a huge target for magic missiles like Fireball, and he's basically just lacking the mobility to escape very scary situations. So if Kolek and Ashaga start chasing after him, he has no way to escape from that whatsoever. I'm really not sure much can be done there in terms of making him a go-to pick over a lord like the Glady in multiplayer because the problems he has are kind of just inherent in his design and the design of similar monsters already in the game, like Hyro Titans and Giants. Far from unusable, Durthu is a lord that is simply not a top-tier pick either, and I'm not sure he ever will be. Past Orion and Durthu though, there needs to be at least a third legendary lord. 
You can kind of get away with it for a faction like Norska only having two because they're a minor race who took their lord straight from the Warriors of Chaos army book. Although, to be honest, I do think Norska should be getting Egil Steerborn or Lord Mortkin or some other Norskin legendary lord. There are some great choices there that would be relatively easy to implement that would flesh them out very nicely. But for a major 8th edition tabletop race to only have two this far into the trilogy is really sad. So, that means Araloth, Drycha, the Sisters of Twilight, or the Queen of Alpha Lauren herself to stand up and be recognized. It's time for one of them to fill that third slot. And Araloth, despite the fact that he has a massive role to play in the end times and a hunting hawk named Scarin, is still at the end of the day about as white bread and boring as a character could possibly be. He's a no-go from my side of things. I think he really wouldn't offer much to the trilogy at all. Drycha, in my opinion, is much more interesting. A malevolent tree spirit with a heavy emphasis on dryads, branch race, and ambushing, I think she has a much more clear avenue to differentiate herself from the other two lords already in the game. And because she's a spirit, you can very easily justify starting her in Lorelorn or somewhere far away from Athel Lauren. Just like Durthu, she has the ability to use the world roots to teleport to other magical forests. So once she broke the waystone surrounding the Wildwood and freed Coetel from his prison, they could basically go to any area of the map that has a magical forest that they wanted. Her fanatical resolve special rule would make her deal more damage the lower her health gets, and Roused to Wrath would allow her to summon Dryads. That's a really good unit to summon, actually. Dryads, very good. At 550 gold, you're getting a lot of value from that kind of summon, so I think she'd be pretty cool. The Sisters of Twilight, Nystra and Arahan, Heroes of Pine Crags, have arguably been the frontrunners for the third slot since the Wood Elves were first announced, and I think they have incredibly cool lore. The yin to each other's yang, with Nystra representing the purity and nobility of the Azrai, while Arahan represents the savage aggression and eagerness to hunt. Their conjoined destiny special rule means that should one be killed, they'll return moments later, fully healed, as long as the other one remains alive. And this has manifested itself through the years pretty spectacularly, where Arahan has been chopped down on by a Gorgon or decapitated by a vampire, only to return to life moments later to eviscerate her attacker. They can choose between riding the Great Eagle Gwindalor or the Forest Dragon Scython Har, and would honestly kind of be pretty challenging to implement, so I think that's probably the biggest bar, the biggest hurdle they'll have to kind of overcome. It, honestly, I'm kind of curious if CA would decide to make them two separate entities with conjoined life bars. So basically you'd have two separate Lord and Hero and they're completely separate from each other. So you can move them around wherever you want, shoot wherever you want. But if one of them dies, the other dies as well. Or just make them a single unit with two models similar to Skarsnik and Goblin. Ones that you can't actually separate. I think they might go the Skarsnik and Goblin route if they ever came in. But making those animations work out would be kind of challenging. I think it'd be kind of fun to watch. And then of course there's Ariel the Mage Queen herself. A bullet with butterfly wings. She's got a mean temper and would easily be one of the best casters in the series. Frankly, it'd be nice to have a mixed lore caster, legendary lord, representing Isha on the mortal plane. A mix of high magic, dark magic, and the lore of life would suit her very well. Remember, there was a period of time in Athlorn's history where she became very corrupted by dark magic and kind of had a huge impact, a negative impact, on the forest itself. And I think that that could be reflected pretty well by giving her access to at least two or three dark magic spells. And then she'd also have the, the Wand of the Witch Elm, Heartstone of Alpha Lauren, and those things would provide her a huge Winds of Magic pool to work with and resistance against incoming damage. So of the potential Lords, Araloth, Drycha, Sisters of Twilight, and Ariel, I'm curious who you guys would like to see, who you would prefer. And would you be okay with them being moved outside of Alpha Lauren to Lorlorn or Heart of the Jungle or one of those other magical forests on the map? Or would you want them to stick around in Athel Lauren and make it lore friendly? I'm personally on the boat that I think if they give a decent lore explanation for why they're somewhere else on the map, then go for it because I'd rather have the unique star position just so it can have that replayability. I think lore is obviously very important, but when you're starting one province over from the King's Glade, it's really not a different perspective on the campaign at all. And I think that replayability is maybe a more important factor here, as long as they can come up with a decent lore excuse for why they're chilling in a new region. Now, as for general gameplay and quality of life changes, 
it would be nice if CA would actually fix Arrow of Carnus and make it usable again. I remember it was very overpowered in game one when it had unlimited uses, and I'm glad it was nerfed, but once they kept it to three, they didn't really need to touch it anymore, and I'm not really sure what happened in game two, but as soon as it came out in game two, it's basically become this alcoholic inbred cousin of Fireball. It's a magic missile that cannot hit the broad side of a barn, it does minimal damage, it's erratic and unstable and really bizarre, and I have no idea what happened to it, but I would like to see Arrow of Carnus get fixed. And while you're at it, give Glade Riders and Starfire Shafts their magic damage back. The Dwarf matchup is already completely busted. It's not any better. It's not more fun now. But the Wood Elves would certainly like to have more magic damage options when they're going up against the rest of the factions of Warhammer 2. Factions like the Dark Elves and the High Elves, who rely on that physical resist. You like to have more magic damage options in those matchups. I think the balance team were too callous in stripping away magic damage out of like half their roster, and at this point, it's unlikely you will ever see me even slightly try to take on a competitive game from the Wood Elves or the Dwarves perspective if they're going head to head, because it's just not fun. It's probably the most broken in terms of mechanics matchup of any matchup in Total War Warhammer, period, and it's not fun to play. If you're going to be playing the Wood Elves side of things, you have to spam Waywashers and kite for 20 minutes, or you're going to lose. And if you're playing Dwarfs, you just kind of sit there and weather the storm and either lose to Waywatchers or win in a war of attrition. And it is painful to watch. It's like watching paint dry. It's awful. So because that's not going to change, I say give the magic damage back to the Wood Elves anyway, and then say screw the Dwarf matchup because that's going to be busted whether they have magic damage or not. So yeah, those are my thoughts and suggestions about the Wood Elves in Total War Warhammer. I think the core elements that could make them awesome are mostly there, and I dearly love playing with them on the battlefield. I think they're so much fun to play, but they deserve more toys to play with. They deserve updates to their campaign gameplay, which is definitely looking pretty old, pretty raggedy at this point, and they deserve a third Legendary Lord to fully bring them up to speed with the rest of the cast. So let me know what you'd like to see for the Wood Elves going forward how you'd like to update them and finally get them into a good spot. And I'll see you all in the next video. Indie Pride, signing out for now.